Hey ladies, listen up. We have a public service announcement here in the suite. To celebrate Women's History Month, Transamerica will donate $1 to Savvy Ladies for every social engagement during the month of March in support of their mission, empowering women to achieve financial independence. Simply tag Savvy Ladies, that's S-A-V-V-Y-L-A-D-I-E-S, and use the hashtag Women Who Inspire. And in case you don't know about Savvy Ladies, they offer a 24-hour hotline to women in need of legal and financial advice, as well as resources and education for women who want to become financially independent. You can check them out at SavvyLadies.org. Thanks. Hi, this is Tina Powell, host of In The Suite where I sit down with top women leaders and some of the biggest names in the financial services and the wealth management industry. Together, we'll discover some of their best secrets and top strategies to grow great business, build a strong brand, and lead teams in the 21st century. I hope you'll enjoy hearing their amazing personal stories of triumph, trepidation, and transformation in hopes of becoming better leaders ourselves. The time for you to lead is now and you're in the suite. Three weeks from the date of this original recording, Abby Salome announced her departure from Hightower Advisors. Truth be told, I was totally caught off guard. After all, why would Abby, one of the industry's most successful CMOs, decide to leave her 21-month stint at the Chicago-based Hightower with 115 offices in 33 states, listed number three on Barron's top IRA firms in 2020 with $79.6 billion of AUM as of February 23rd, 2021? What she told Ian Wenick of CityWire RA is this, and I quote, This was a very personal decision, taking a reset to focus on family first with three teens at home in this pandemic has brought me to really think about what's important and what I want to do next, end quote. Not surprisingly, the emerging themes of this interview with Abby Salome touch on life during the pandemic while being a wife, a mom of three teenagers, and a daughter of aging parents. We also talk about working alongside industry greats such as Bob Aros, chairman and CEO of Hightower, Tom Bradley at TD Ameritrade Institutional, and the amazing Suzanne Syracuse, episode 28, the former CEO and publisher of Investment News. As you might expect, when two women who share a lifelong love affair with marketing come into the suite, well, naturally, they talk about marketing. Specifically, I ask Abby about the genesis of the Wealth Rebalanced Rebrand at Hightower, a project of enormous proportions, touching over 3,500 pieces of collateral, a network of 63 advisory businesses, and the main corporate office. If you haven't checked it out, you should. It's that good. Before coming to Hightower Advisors, Abby spent nearly six years as CMO at Private Advisor Group, a hybrid RA solution for independent advisors with over 600 advisors. Before that, Abby spent five years at TD Ameritrade Institutional as head of institutional marketing and was VP at Investment News for seven years. Abby has a BBA in finance and economics from Hofstra University and in September of 2020, while at Hightower Advisors, Abby Salome received the prestigious Thought Leader of the Year Award from WealthManagement.com. One of the many gifts that you'll discover about Abby Salome in this episode is her passion to make a meaningful contribution wherever she goes. She loves to build things, grow things, and will no doubt move the needle in her next chapter. But Abby is also the type of person who is intuitive and intentional. She leads with strength and authenticity while caring deeply about people, especially her family and her teenage kids, and all the simple things in life that money can't buy in the suite. I am so excited today, you guys. You cannot believe the episode that we have. I mean, every episode in the suite is amazing. Let's just face it. But today we have Abby Salome. 
Wow, Abby Salome, take a seat in the suite. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Tina. It's great to be here. Wow, you know, I think about how awesome that things fall into alignment here. And one of the amazing things that happened to you in 2020 was that you were named Individual REA Thought Leader of the Year by WealthManagement.com at the 2020 Industry Awards back in September. I was so, so, I was doing the happy dance for you, Abby. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, It was really an honor. And I was incredibly surprised because the lineup of finalists were really impressive. So for me, it was a little surprising. But of course, I was super sad because that's always a really fun event to go to in person. And it would have been even more fun to be there and celebrate. Well, I know that we are going to be there in person in September. And I know that you and all of Hightower Advisors will be there. And so I expect to see you guys uh, finalists in lots of categories, because let's face it, you know, as a chief marketing officer, you have an incredible job. Like I told you before, when we were talking, I said, wow, you're, you're chief marketing officer of a rocket ship right now. And a rocket ship it is. We have grown so much over the course of the last two years since Bob Oros, our CEO and fearless leader, I like to say, since he came on board, um, we have really transformed the entire business and it feels like a rocket ship. We are moving so quickly and growing so fast and evolving in ways that even surprise me. So it's been quite quite a journey, I will say. It was interesting. I I saw a recent tweet of yours and naturally we're going to have your Twitter and all your LinkedIn so everybody can follow all of your great stuff. But you had this announcement and that is that you are a speaker at the Risk Allies Fearless Investing Summit in person September 29th to October 1st in beautiful Palm Springs, California. You'll be there. Aaron Klein will be there. Lori Hardwick will be there. Michael Kitsis, Stephanie Bogan, Renee Norse. Wow. Talk about an all-star lineup. But here it is. It's in person. I I cannot wait. I mean, the in-person, the thought of in-person and seeing people in person in real life is so exciting to me. And that will probably be the first event I think I will go to in person. Um, at Hightower, we we do a lot of events. My events team reports into me as well. And it was really hard pivoting from doing in-person events to this whole virtual event platform. And I think people are starting to get fatigue from the virtual events. So it will be fantastic to be together with that kind of powerhouse lineup and just see friends old and new and uh, be able to share ideas and and learn in person. So I'm so excited. I saw you the first time that we met was at a conference in uh, Atlantic City that you put together. It was in your your prior role as chief marketing officer at Private Advisor Group. Again, a very big, big responsibility. One of my first clients, Rick Capozzi, the author of The Growth Mindset, was speaking at your event. And I remember I was so impressed, Abby, like every single detail. And I said to Rick, I was like, wow, this, this, this Abby really, really knows her stuff. Every single detail of execution was nailed to the T. So I thought that, you know, we're being that risk allies is coming up. You've done a lot of events for high tower as well. You know, let's kind of talk to the audience about warming them back up to either virtual events or in-person events. What would be your advice? How do you evaluate the merits of whether or not to go to one thing versus another? First of all, I do remember meeting you. So I just want to tell you that I do remember meeting you. And I remember that event at the Borgata in Atlantic City, right? And thank you for those kind comments. I really appreciate it. Um, I think when when I start thinking about in-person events, and this pandemic has really had me stop and pause and rethink do we have to be in person all the time, right? Because there are so many things that we can do virtually now, and the technology has proven itself to be very worthy of 
communicating and engaging and socializing and collaborating. So it has to be something where I think I would feel like, A, I would learn something from attending this event, and B, the attendees of the event are people that I would want to be able to see. So those would be the two criteria that I think will come heavily into my own decision-making process. Of course, our Hightower community, which is comprised of 115 different advisory businesses, they can't wait to get back to in-person because part of what makes Hightower so special is the community. It's so tight-knit. It's so interwoven that I know that they can't wait to, to see one another again because it's like missing family. Just like I can't wait to see my family again you know, and give my parents a hug. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I found that when I was actually doing the research for this episode, you know, one of the things that I love your use of being as a chief marketing officer, which explains you being RIA thought leader of the year is how you have embraced digital channels. Thank you very much. So I saw the videos on YouTube from prior Hightower events, and I thought that it was really great. I think that more and more events people should be looking to extend the shelf life of their events, memorializing it, what people have learned, those takeaways. So I could feel the energy from your advisors there too. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And everything we do now, um, we were very quick to adopt virtual technology. Thankfully, we've got an amazing tech team at Hightower that already had our technology built out. It was just nobody was really adopting it. And this kind of catapulted us into adopting all of that technology. And now it's not even a thought. Like, of course, you're going to archive the sessions. Of course, you're going to edit them and then reuse them and repurpose them in any way that you possibly can. So I think this definitely has helped us all the entire industry move forward into this digital space pretty quickly. Talking about rebranding, people don't even realize what it is. They think, yeah, you know, you're going to slap on logo and you're going to, you know, use different fonts. But really, if you could explain, you know, what is a rebrand? Why did you do it? And a little bit about that, that backstory, because what you've created is really really incredible. Thank you. So, you know, coming on board to Hightower, it was a firm that had been established in 2008, but it had never had a brand refresh since it was initially launched. And the business model had changed quite a bit since the founding of the organization, and yet the brand had never been updated or refreshed. So one of the first things I embarked on was the process of rebranding Hightower. And people don't understand how much work goes into a rebranding project. So starting with identifying 30 stakeholders within the organization, and that included advisors that are part of Hightower, their field professionals or staff members that are part of Hightower, some Hightower corporate employees to come together and do some proprietary research and get interviews. I hired a firm called Optima to do all of these interviews with all of our internal stakeholders to find out what makes Hightower so unique. And then we literally got together two times in Chicago for three days each to do like boot camp uncovering of what Hightower's attributes were. What do we stand for? What do, what do we want to be? And how do we serve the community and the market? And we contracted with a different firm to do all of that type of, of work with us. And then the third piece of that was going out into the market and the industry to find out what the industry thought of Hightower and to find out where we needed to align all of those different pieces together. And what we uncovered was that wealth is about more than just finances. And ultimately, that was the that was the message that kept coming up. Little did I know that I would be so fortuitous to have this concept of wealth, W-E-L-L-T-H, rebalanced right before a pandemic hit, which 
causes everybody to stop and say, what does being wealthy really mean to me? So it was a very laborious process. It took about a year to finally come up with our brand. It was not something that we took lightly. And then we had to embark on changing 3,500 pieces of collateral, all of our websites, all of our advisory businesses that brand to the high tower brand. We had to change all of their collateral, all of our social media. So it's not a project that um, it shaped a couple of years off my life, I think. For sure. <laughs> well, I wouldn't know it by looking at you right now, Abby. My gosh, you look awesome. The same way that I that I left you in Atlantic City, you know, <laughs> three or four years ago. I think it's incredible, though, the amount of work and just how you approached it. And a brand is like a culmination. It's perception. It's what people believe you to be. And so you pulled out, you extracted the catchphrase of 2020. <laughs> and, and you even wrote, you even wrote an awesome article. And it's it's coronavirus had some really good effects on us. But I thought rather than me read it, nobody needs to hear my voice. I'd love to hear more of your voice in your own words, because this was so good. And Abby's a, a mother, you've got three kids, she's got three teenagers, and she shows up to this podcast looking amazing. Thank you for that. And this was definitely a personal statement. And it's truth. It comes from my heart. I know my own definition of wealth has changed quite a bit this year. Being wealthy to me now means giving my aging parents a hug, seeing my teenage children surrounded by friends or playing the sports that they love, watching my high school senior go to prom, which who knows if that's going to happen. I'm not sure. Uh, at this point, I don't really know. And to me, wealth rebalance now really reflects the simple things in life that money can't buy. So it's reshifted my focus completely and reprioritized what's important, which I think it's done for many. Yeah. How has a shift like that, a paradigm shift, how have you seen it manifest in your own life and also too, even at Hightower? Yeah. So, you know, like I said, I think there's been a huge reshift and to things that are not necessarily money related or financial related. And, you know, I know I've started to appreciate the little things that we take for granted, you know, like the hugs that we want to give our our parents, our aging parents, going to the movies. You know, it was my husband's birthday two weeks ago and we rented a movie theater out just for the five of us to go Whoa. sit in the movie theater by ourselves and eat popcorn and pretzel nuggets and candy. But like, it felt like a little slice of normalcy. Um, going out for dinners, going to sporting events and vacations. I miss vacations, sitting at a bar on a Friday night with my husband eating dinner because that's like our favorite thing to do on a Friday night. And, you know, there's there's been challenges there. So personally, I think it's it's made me appreciate the normal things that we took for granted a little bit more. Professionally, I think that what I've learned is that we don't always need to be traveling on the road. You know, half my team is in New York and half is in Chicago. And I spent the last two years, I would say, every week going back and forth in addition wow. to in addition to the industry conferences that I would speak at or the industry conferences that I was attending or even our own high tower conferences, you know, for a year straight, I would say I was on the road every single week. And I don't think that that has to be the case. You know, our technology has proven that we can be collaborative, that we can work more productively even without having to be on the road that frequently. And, um, you know, our offices are still closed. You know, our headquarters is Chicago and New York, and we're not, we don't have a plan to go back in right now. And I would say my team is even more productive than ever because we have the use of this amazing collaboration technology that uh, we've been able to integrate with everything else that we do. I've heard from people, and no matter what 
vertical that they're working in, financial services, manufacturing. Everybody says they're working more now than they ever have been. And yet the it's so ironic because there was such a bias towards not working from home, like working from home meant that you were lazy and that you were taking breaks. And here it is, everybody's just doing the polar opposite. And I think never have our companies and countries, but and culture have been stronger as a result of the pandemic. I would agree. I mean, I know for me, it's super hard to separate personal life from my work life because it's so easy to just work. So if I'm home on a Saturday and I'm doing 20 loads of laundry, which I happen to really like to do, believe it or not, it's therapy for me, therapeutic. I hate yeah. holding it and putting it away, but I don't mind doing it. But, you know, what's to stop me from bringing my laptop along into the laundry room and just, you know, getting some work done while I'm waiting for the dryer to finish. So there is a, there's really a, a, it's hard to kind of separate the two. So I think everybody feels that way because there's nothing for us to do right now. Like where are we going and what are we doing? We may as well work, right? Yeah. What are some strategies for women who really want to excel in the C-suite in a leadership capacity that still are trying to, they have responsibilities at, at home and they have a huge amount to do at work. What would be your advice to them? Are there solutions that you use that you think that, you know, hacks that, that people that are awesome listeners right now could adapt to their own life? You know, it's interesting because I have put a lot of thought into that question especially because I have a teenage daughter and, you know, I hope that I'm a good role model for her. And I do want her to believe that she can be anything she wants to be in life. But the reality is that you, you really cannot have it all, right? Mm -hmm. So if you choose one thing, something else has to give. We only have so many hours in the day. We only have so much inside us to give to anything we do. So it's really important to manage that aspect. And I make sure that I am present when I am present with my children. Mm -hmm. And the Peloton and wine have been my saviors. <laughs> uh, they have been my religion. <laughs> oh my God, we should put, uh, who's your favorite instructor in Peloton right now? I'm a Cody Rigsby fan. I love Cody. I love him. <laughs> oh my God. You know what my secret fantasy is right now is to be at the Peloton New York City studios to be. Let's do like, it. <laughs> yes, we need to do it. Is he awesome? Awesome. I, and his playlists are like 70s, 80s. And he's got like, yeah, I, lo I love it. He cracks me up. He's so good. He's so funny. Like he really makes me laugh. And that's what I need right now. Like I clip in and he lightens my mood and he makes me smile and the endorphins get pumping. And I do it every single day, sometimes twice a day if I need to, because it's a great stress reliever for me. Wow. You guys heard it here first in the suite, the ultimate hack here, the Peloton with Cody Rigsby. And all they better the send me some, some swag now, right? Exactly. I was even thinking like, hey, Peloton, uh, yeah, we've got to find a way for them to get on the podcast. Send, send Abby some swag for sure, because that's a big, big shout out. It was the best investment I made. I bought the Peloton right when the pandemic hit. And uh, it's been the most amazing investment, in my opinion. Yeah. And I bought the other side. I bought the stock. <laughs> <laughs> I probably should have done that. <laughs> so you got the bike and I've got the stock, but we both won, right? We both... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, and we both did. I did it before because when I, it was such a game changer, right? The founder of Peloton, his name escapes me right now, but Reed Hoffman has had him on his podcast, Masters of Scale. And so he's interviewed and he's got, got, got a background like in engineering and all this whole, like all these patents. And so he went through like 200 doors slamming on his face before people like actually said, uh, yeah, actually, this is a cool thing. And nobody realizes that, right? Like we look at Peloton, we look at the stock, we look at the bike, we look at everything like, oh, yeah, this is like came out swinging just from day one. And no, listen to that. I'm, we're going to put a link in the show notes. You will be blown away at how many people passed on Peloton. I can't wait. I can't wait. I'm going to go actually look for that and see if I could even get him as a speaker for one of our high tower events. 
That's an awesome idea. And the other thing is that he was a little bit older, right? So normally in the startup world, you know, the Warby Parker glasses with, uh, you know, cool shoes and all that. And he had that, but he was a little bit older as well. And so, you know, he talked a little bit about that ageism and that when he went, the people made an unfair judgment about him. So I cannot wait to talk to you about that episode over wine and Peloton. Yes, (laughs) for sure. Hey, listeners, you can now text me at 201-581-3983 to join our community in the suite. After you do that, I'll be lifting you up, inspiring you, and supercharging your life and career with awesome quotes, resources, videos, and tips we learn from our great guests. It couldn't be any easier. Just text 201-581-3983. You've had a 20 year career in this industry at some very incredible brands. And we brought Suzanne Syracuse into the suite. And I had no idea that you guys were, that you were part of the the founding partners, members, the brain trust that went into investment news. You were VP there for seven years. You know, and then on top of that, you were also at TD Ameritrade for, for five years. Does it surprise you where you are now, kind of looking back? No, it really doesn't. Because when I look at my career and I look at what I love to do, I love to grow things and I love to build things. So starting at starting Investment News was also a labor of love. You know, it was starting something new. And Suzanne will, will tell you if you speak to her again. Um, She remembers when I joined the founding team, it was literally three of us that were starting this publication. We had no publication. We were like holding up a mock copy of what investment news would look like. And um, she will tell you that she remembers my pink suit that I was wearing, which is hysterical. But, you know, thinking about those days where we were touting a weekly newspaper for financial advisors because there was none that existed and the internet wasn't even something that was available at the time, um, which definitely shows my age. Um, but, but I'm there with you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I remember that too. And I knew nothing about publishing because prior to that, I had worked at um, Sanford Bernstein when it was Sanford Bernstein. So I had come from the finance side, went into publishing, knowing nothing about publishing, but just loving the concept and knew that, you know, if I wanted to do something, I could easily do it. Fake it till you make it. Right. Right. So joined that team. And really, we built out that publication. We turned it profitable within three years, which was really quite amazing. And then um, TD Waterhouse was one of my advertising clients at the time. And they were just a fledgling little custodian. And they were looking for somebody to come in and spearhead the growth of the marketing department to support the institutional services. So um, I was like, you know, that sounds like fun, right? So I called Tom Bradley and pushed my way in there. And even though I really had no marketing experience, you know, at all, I somehow convinced him that I could spearhead the the build out of the marketing department for TD Waterhouse and then TD Ameritrade. And in that capacity, kept expanding my role into many other things. And that was a great journey. And, you know, I, I probably would have stayed at TD, but I had three kids in four years. And at that time, I just couldn't, I couldn't juggle it at the moment. And that's a very difficult decision. But looking at where I am today, you know, I've always enjoyed growth minded organizations that have a desire to build Mm. and grow. And that's just who I am. You know, I love that pace. I love pushing things forward. I love moving the needle. And being that you've worked for so many awesome leaders, Tom Bradley, Bob Oros, what does the negotiating table look like? There are a lot of women right now and men men too. Right now, coronavirus has been a fork in the road. People have been reevaluating both their business life and their, their home life and making major moves. I, I made a major move uh, with my home life. It was absolutely the right thing to do. And... You know, I considered a lot of criteria. I feel that the industry has gone a little bit more 
growth minded, like people are definitely taking more chances, M&A, venture capital, like there's different players here who then embrace that mindset of growth. How do you get your vision across? I mean, personally, I have been told at times that I'm unintentionally aggressive which is not something that I disagree with, right? Because I have such a drive to move things forward. And when I have a clear vision of what I want to contribute to an organization, nothing will get in my way of getting there, but in a collaborative manner. But I think you do need to have buy-in and you need, you need to work as a team. And it's defining and and, um, accepting partnerships and roles and responsibilities amongst the team and the different business units and really working together to move the needle forward for the organization. So taking a look at it from a top-down approach and understanding all of the different priorities that we have and how we're going to, where we're going to deploy limited resources and investments. So that's something that I think I've gotten a lot better at in my older years in not just thinking about my own thought process, but understanding what we need to look at as as an entire organization. But to get buy-in, I have to believe in what I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. So that is the first criteria of my decision-making process as to whether or not to even consider an opportunity or a job. Do I believe in what the end goal is? Do I wanna be part of creating that end goal? Will I have a seat at the table where my voice is heard and I'm part of that dialogue and conversation? And can I see myself working with these people and collaborating to create something really unique? So for me, it really does come down to passion around what we're trying to accomplish, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. And it sounds like you approach these types of you know, major growth opportunities with the servant leadership type of mindset. And and that is, I, I think the example was right at the beginning of the podcast when you talked about the rebrand and acknowledging the external stakeholders first. Like it, it, you, you didn't even start from the inside, which was so like, it was such a, it's such a powerful aha moment thinking about all of the people that touch the ramifications of a decision. And if we just get people to be involved, and now there's collaborative tools, there's Slack, there's Basecamp, there's so many different ways. There's even Zoom, there's chats, there's ways for people to voice their opinion. Yeah. So, I mean, speaking of Slack, you know, we have um, an internal resource center, which is called Clear. And within Clear, all of our advisors have to access Clear to access any of their work, their accounts, their clients. You know, it's built on Salesforce. And we have this chat function within Clear, which is like a Slack. It's like our version of Slack. And all day long, people are typing back and forth. Like, does anybody have an estate planner in Kalamazoo that you can recommend for a client of mine? Or there's a new campaign that's available through our digital marketing platform that's targeting you know, divorced women, you can access it here. Or don't forget, there's a webinar tomorrow on the markets and the economic impact from the new tax rules. You know, so all day long, this goes on between advisors, their staff members, the corporate employees. So it's ongoing communication and collaboration. And then in addition to that, we also have WebEx teams where we have different groups. Think like almost study groups. People have said like there's a Hightower Peloton group where we all ride together, you know, like hashtag Hightower advisors. And we'll go on the Peloton group and we'll be like, I'm taking this class tomorrow morning. Who's in? And the next morning I see 10 of my colleagues or coworkers or advisors from other parts of the country are on my ride with me and we can high five each other. So it's creating that type of community that is really special. That is so, so cool. So, so cool. And and that's the thing where technology has done such an amazing job during the pandemic to bring us closer together in a human capacity, right? It's those two things together 
and and once again, Peloton comes out. Pel- <laughs> you can write, and Peloton has the writing classes. They have a treadmill. My cousin has the treadmill, and then you also too have yoga classes too. So just because you don't bike doesn't mean that you shouldn't try it. But what an awesome thing to do to bring people together. You know, I think that you remind us, Abby, the the power of the the high tower example. No matter what size organization, don't let the size of your organization trip you up. Yeah, I agree. I mean, because really, it's all about, in my opinion, and in my leadership, like, I'm all about my people. I am a people first person. I like to make sure that I, I take it very seriously, the fact that the people that I employ, I'm responsible for their careers, and for mentoring them, and for shepherding them along in in their next journey of their career. So for me, getting my team together on a regular basis is of utmost importance. And we do that through, you know, a multitude of ways, which of course have all been, you know, virtual this year, but still fun. We've come up with some really fun ideas and ways to to have fun together. Besides the Peloton, anything else that we should know about? That we we've know? done scavenger hunts and we've done cooking classes and we've done, you know, wine tastings. And we're just planning this. Um, this is really cool. There's a company, I can't think of the name, but they will do things like flower arrangements. So you can, they'll ship the flowers and then you join the the virtual meeting and they show you how to actually arrange them. So, you know, we're always looking for like new and unique ways that we can create fun and engagement that are nothing to do with work. And so, and the funny thing is, is that they're nothing to do for work, but yet your people, you're creating such an awesome culture. Your people are so happy. They only want to work harder smarter, longer, and get more. They're so enthusiastic about the way that they approach their work is so different because you've showed that you cared. I I could not agree more. I think when people feel appreciated and heard, they will go jump through hoops for you, right? And it's not an intentional thing. That's not why I do it. I do it because I really do care. I lead with authenticity. I mean, I'm sure you can tell I'm really an authentic person. There's not a fake bone in my body. So I think my team knows that too. So I do lead with authenticity and I really do care. A lot of people are dealing with issues that we don't necessarily get to hear in the, in the old environment or before the pandemic you would be near the water cooler, the quintessential water cooler discussion. Somebody might have learned something like, hey, Jake is, Jake's not having a a good day. Like even like, oh, wow, Jake's dog is sick. Like he's really upset. And then somebody would like, it would pass from one person to another. And now by virtue of of a virtual world, we're not privy to just even just the, the casual conversations that might go back and forth that do affect our people. We we tend to look at the business books, the leadership books. And what about just saying, hey, wait, you know, put those aside and just ask everybody how they're doing and maybe do like a fun event for them. There, there it is. You're going to move the needle. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's so interesting to see how many people have also adopted pets during this time. Yeah. For similar yeah. reasons, right? Oh yeah, we're having um, we're interviewing Martine Lellis, another rock star woman in the industry, and now she is fostering cats. So I wanted to ask her about that question and literally put that in the in the notes today. I've never fostered an animal before. You know what's that like? And yeah, it's good. I think a lot of animals too need to be saved. A lot of us just need tender, loving care. I think is is the ba- main takeaway here. Hundred percent. Hundred percent agree. And so, being that you know we're working in an environment that is compliance, right? Financial services. That we have a lot of people listening to the broadcast that are actually not in the industry. 
there are other industries that are also have some form of regulation. But I wanted to ask you this question because it is, it's a, it was a big change. The SEC ruling about allowing testimonials, it affects every single marketer right now in financial services. So I, I wanted to hear a little bit about your ideas and if there's some sort of it's high tower, are you planning on doing something different? It's a big change. It, it is a big change. And it's like, it's, it's about time, right? Because we've been living in this world of Yelp rate ratings and testimonials and reviews on social media for so long. And yet financial services has been prohibited from doing any of that. Um, so yes, I am cautiously excited about this opportunity to leverage testimonials. And we are right now formulating our policy around it because of course we need to understand the, I think it was like 435 pages of you know rules and regulations that the SEC came out with. So our compliance team has already gone through that. We've already identified the key points and we're putting together our policy document. In the meantime, we're already socializing the concept with our advisors and my advisor facing marketing team, which works directly with our advisors on helping them with their own marketing efforts, has already started to reach out and talk to our advisory businesses about thinking about who they might want to use of their existing clients for these types of testimonials. And then we have the medium and the means to do and help them execute campaigns once we're able to, whether it's video, podcast, blog post, advertising, social advertising, things like that. But where I'm very cautious is around the rankings and the ratings, you know, and the reviews, because, you know, as much as there could be really good reviews, don't forget, there can also be bad reviews. And some bad reviews don't even necessarily have to be real. They could be fake reviews that people go on your website and write or go on your LinkedIn um, page and write. It could be a vendetta from 20 years ago that you don't know anything about. And according to the rule, you have to make public both the good and the bad. So, you know, so there's some caution there because that could be a full-time job, just monitoring reviews to make sure that if there's a negative review, you're soliciting more positive reviews to push those negative reviews down. So there's a lot we still don't know and a lot that I don't think we've made decisions around whether or not we're going to allow our advisors to use um, until we come up with our formal policy around this. But certainly testimonials from clients is something that I'm excited about taking advantage of. And this this new rule also allows you to, to to use endorsements. So for our advisors who have celebrity clients or athletes as clients, being able to tap into those clients and get them to do testimonials will be really exciting. So I'm excited to see what happens there. Yeah. And the reason why I bring it up, because again, there are a lot of people who are listening to the podcast that have never worked with a financial advisor before. And so let's face it, the industry doesn't have the best reputation. People make an automatic assumption that, or some people, I shouldn't say all people, but you know, the way our advertising has been, is like this like insurance agent that's trying to sell you all of these things. No, 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 no. There's certified financial planners. There's some really good good firms. And so somebody even vetting a financial advisor looking on a LinkedIn, and you don't see a recommendation there or somebody writing something, there's reason for that, ladies and gentlemen, that they have not been allowed to that. They have even been so, I guess, afraid of the SEC that um, there, there's a, an endorsement, like a skills endorsement. It's like, yes, for investment management, financial planning, even you'll find a lot of advisors have turned that off. So don't, you know, as you're listening right now to this episode and you're vetting your own financial advisor, don't look in the absence of things, make an automatic judgment call. It's because that there has been guidance in the industry that's prevented people from, you know, expressing and branding themselves the way they want. 
A hundred percent. So it's not like going to, you know, a review on Yelp for a local business. Financial advisors have been prohibited from doing any of that or allowing any of that. So it does make it difficult, which is why, you know, most of financial advisors, their growth strategies have historically been centered around referrals and and working with centers of influence that, you know, can help them drive leads and referrals to their business because they haven't been able to have that type of marketing and branding online that so many other companies have. Yeah. And do you think that leads and and the, the referrals and the COI strategy, do you still see that as like the primary growth lead mechanisms for advisors, still that referral strategy and that center of influence strategy? Um, I think there are always going to be anchor methods and approaches to to gaining and, and harnessing new business. But I think that what we've seen is if we help our advisors in empowering them to provide valuable content to their centers of influence and maintaining frequency in front of their prospects or reminding their, their clients that they are looking for referrals. So we've we've been able to really amplify that referral stream by just delivering content, really content is king, um, that they can then leverage in social media, in the version of digital storyboards or white papers and driving camp automated campaigns and just maintaining their voice out there in the industry with their circle of influence. Yeah, which is a really cool value proposition for advisors joining Hightower is that you have the content there and you have the technology mechanism that no matter how many advisors you bring on, you can do it at scale. So I know that there there are going to definitely be people wanting to get in touch with you. So what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? But don't leave us yet. We have one, one great last question, but go ahead. So certainly LinkedIn and Twitter. I'm an active LinkedIn tweeter. Um, and that's uh, Abby Salome, easy peasy. And then uh, you can always email me. It's a Salome at HightowerAdvisors.com. And I'm always responsive. So I, like I said, I work a lot. So I'm always around and I'm always, you know, working. There's nothing else to do right now. I may have a glass or two of champagne in me, but I'll be working and I will respond. Oh, so that's great. So you heard heard it here first. Have a glass of champagne with Abby. Give her give her a ring and follow her definitely on LinkedIn and Twitter because there's some great announcements and things coming up. So we've kind of changed it up this year that we would ask a, a different question, and that is that we're looking at a at a book recommendation. And just for your episode, it's swear to God, it's so it's so ironic. You were the first guest that I've asked for a song recommendation as well, too. And I'm so glad that I did that because if you are a Cody Rigsby fan on Peloton, you've got to give us a song and a book that is going to make 2021 our wealthiest W-E-L-L dash T-H that is brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. So my favorite book, and I will go back to this book. I might not read it for 10 years and then I go back to it and I recently read it again and I probably haven't read it in over a decade. And and it will always be my favorite book is The Alchemist. Because like you and I were talking about earlier before we started recording, the decisions we make in life ultimately bring us to where we were meant to be. And that message is so strong and it still holds true for any decision that we all make in life. So I try not to stress decision making too much because I firmly believe that we are meant to be where we are today. And that book continues to reinforce that message for me. And then in terms of songs, you know, thinking about this, and I live in New Jersey, and my office is in New York. And when I do eventually get back into my office, it's going to be like a time capsule, I have, I'll probably have like a half drunk coffee cup on my desk, and the papers there will all be dated from February of last year. And I probably have shoes in my office and uh, clothes in my drawers. And st- and I hope I didn't leave any snacks out. But, <laughs> but I really, um, I miss New York City so much. 
I lived in New York City for 20 years and before moving to New Jersey. So I would have to say that I have three songs that are my go-to songs right now. One is New York by Alicia Keys. Mm. just gives me goosebumps and then a new york state of mind by billy joel and then obviously new york new york by the best and only frank sinatra because i cannot wait to get our beloved new york city back and to see the lights and the restaurants and the hustle and the bustle and the energy that that the city so desperately needs again Really, really awesome, awesome recommendations on the songs. And what a great book recommendation too. just everything, everything that you've instilled in us today has been perfect for this time in our lives, you know, as we're looking to transition and definitely we're going to all go to risk allies and we're going to see Abby Salome uh, speaking in the stage and we're going to all have wine and champagne. Um, But seriously, we're going to learn a lot, right? I think that, you know, bringing all of us together, whether it's a virtual environment, a physical environment, an event environment, there's always something to be learned. And so we learned so much from you today, Abby, and you really inspired us to go back to our businesses and kind of, you know, be that alchemist at work. And how do we make it a little different? So thank you so much for being in this suite, inspiring us and, you know, congratulations on all of your success and wonderful initiatives at, at High Tower. Thank you so much, Tina. I've really enjoyed this and I appreciate you so much for inviting me on. It's been an honor, really. Thank you. You're listening to In The Suite, a podcast that shares amazing stories of women in business and the financial services and the wealth management industry. Our producers are Tina Powell and Kevin Hershorn. Our editor at large is Kevin Hershorn. Our content writers are Carmen Varner and Tina Powell. Our research and technical assistants are Rachel Powell, Sarah Smirker, and Kimmy Rice. In The Suite podcast is sponsored by C-Suite Social Media, a digital marketing and social media agency for C-Suite leaders and companies in finance and technology. You can visit csuitesocialmedia.com to learn more. And thank you so much for listening and subscribing and giving us five-star reviews. We are so, so grateful to you. We've got listeners in 559 cities and 39 countries. This podcast was inspired by you and created for you ladies. So please let us know how you enjoyed this episode with Abby Salome and share your thoughts on LinkedIn and Twitter, hashtag in the suite. You can connect with her on LinkedIn and Twitter at Abby Salome, that's spelled A. A-B-B-Y-S-A-L-A-M-E-H. And always, if you would like to share the name of a rock star woman in financial services we should interview in 2021, please send it to me at Tina at csuitesocialmedia.com. Again, thank you so much for listening and subscribing to In The Suite.